professional engineer in two states, Massachusetts and Indiana. He uh, received his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Purdue University. He then went on to Northeastern University and received a master's in uh, mathematics and physics. Uh, he's worked for 42 years, he worked for 42 years in uh, applied research and development. And for, <clears throat> and for 30 years, he worked at MIT's uh, Drake Laboratory. Um, he also, during the last 25 years, was multitasking on the subject of, quote, challenges of engineering problems. It is my pleasure to introduce our first Thank you. And as Bob mentioned, it's really one thing, it's one of my faults. I have just helped me making short presentations. Uh, last month I presented the world of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Today I'll be talking about just one of those technologies. Now, modifying the 1967 movie story called The Graduate, when Mr. Robinson told Dustin Hoffman, Hoffman one word, plastic. I'm going to say graphene. In the same context that it will also change the world. I think you will agree with me by the end of this presentation. Oh, yeah. Good. Today I'll be talking about the material called graphene, as I just mentioned. This material has been around forever. We all have seen it, but we, including all the scientists, did not recognize that this nanoscale material was produced simply by using a number two pencil that was hidden until recently. In fact, until 2004, many scientists believed that it was not possible to have graphene because it would not be stable material. You remember these pencils and doing sketches? Graphene is right in all those sketches. Fortunately, two scientists at the University of Manchester, Andre Gaines and Konstantin Novoselova, were curious about the electrical properties of flakes of graphite and if they could make those flakes thinner. They continued to explore how thin the graphite flakes could be made and eventually they were left with one layer, one atom thick of carbon, and that is graphene. Having isolated a monolayer, that's a single layer, of graphene for the first time, the pair then began testing the material under the microscope, beginning to realize the enormous potential of its properties. Interestingly, graphene was studied theoretically in 1947. At that time, scientists thought it was physically impossible for a two-dimensional material to exist. Consequently, when Andre and Constantine published their initial findings in 2003, their paper was rejected, not once, but twice. They persisted and finally their paper was published in the Science Journal in 2004. That sparked a global explosion in graphene research. Their technique was as simple as you can get. They removed some flakes from a lump of of the bulk graphite with scotch tape. They noticed some flakes were thinner than others. By separating the graphite fragments repeatedly, they managed to create flakes which were just one atom thick. They had isolated graphene for the first time, and it was a stable material. This process was coined as the scotch tape technique, or technically, Micromechanical cleavage or mechanical exfoliation. And as shown here, it's as simple as this, and I have a little video to demonstrate how they did that. But first, material don't get any thinner than one atom thick. That's pretty small. That's 1.3 with eight zeros in front of it. 
So this stuff was as close to two-dimensional as is physically possible and is referred to as a two-dimensional material. Take a scotch tape and gently lay it down on a flat surface. Next, take clean metal tweezers and pick a thin graphite flake and then place this gently onto the scotch tape. Next, fold the scotch tape at the edge of the graphite flake. Peel it off gently and do this step several times until you obtain a nearly transparent region on the scotch tape. Notice the spots there. What After this, doing is pulling the flakes take apart. a clean silicon wafer to transfer the scotch tape graphene onto the wafer. <clears throat> Use plastic tweezers and gently rub the area of the scotch tape where graphene may potentially be. Slowly peel off the scotch tape so as not to break any potential graphene sheets. Use an optical microscope That's to view many, the many, many graphene. Times. Graphene appears as a purple spot on the screen. At the center of the screen is multi-layer graphene and at the right corner, lower right corner of the screen is single layer graphene. Very sophisticated. <laughs> Their curiosity led to the discovery of making graphene, then to the Nobel Prize in physics in 2010 for their pioneering work. And the pictures here show them receiving <laughs> the medal here. And just for interest, if you're curious, they got $1.2 million. Scotch tape, a lot of scotch tape. Andre and Constantine donated the lump of graphene first used. It's over here. They made a graphene transistor over here, and this was Andre's tape dispenser. <coughs> Very sophisticated stuff. <laughs> More importantly uh, about their discovery, they also were knighted in 2012. So they were moving right along and everybody recognized that graphene is the thing. Mr. G, a really super material. 
is the combination of his unique properties. G is the first 2D crystal ever known to us, the thinnest object ever obtained, and also the lightest one. G is the world's strongest material, harder than diamond, and about 300 times stronger than steel. G conducts electricity much better than copper. G is a transparent material. G is bendable and can take any form you want. And this unique super material gave birth to a new class of crystals that are also just one atom thin. And what's more fantastic is that these can be shuffled with each other to engineer new materials on demand to meet the special needs of different industries. All these factors turn graphene swiftly from the G Research Laboratory to the G Marketplace, driven by demand from industries where such super materials are required. Aerospace, automotive, electronics, energy storage, coatings and paints, communications, sensor, solar, oil, and etc. Thanks to mass production methods intensively being developed, expect to meet Mr. G in person soon. Okay, as Mr. G just illustrated, graphene has the best of the best properties in just about every measurable standard. No other material has the extent of superlatives that graphene was given. Immediately, it was hailed as the super, miracle, wonder, fantastic material with endless uses. I will demonstrate throughout my presentation that that was not an exaggeration. As Mr. G said, it is the lightest, thinnest, strongest material. It is incredibly flexible, like rubber, and more conductive both in electricity and heat than in any material discovered. It is harder than diamond and transparent, wow. almost. It's just a little bit, which actually is good for the material because there's no glaze on top of it. The strength of graphene has been characterized to be so strong, it would take an elephant balanced on a pencil to break through a sheet of graphene the thickness of saran wrap. Another outstanding property of graphene is that it's normally impermeable to all gases and liquids. However, when formed into a graphene oxide-based capillary membrane, both liquid water and water vapor flow through it with little resistance. Electrons move through graphene hundreds of times faster than silicon. Graphene can self-repair holes in its sheet when an imperfect sheet of graphene is bombarded with pure carbon atom, the atoms perfectly align. And here's a hole here, and they bombarded this area, and as you can see, it's all fixed. Instantaneously, after the Science Journal hit the streets in October 2004, the race was on. Deep pocket industries and universities with government support all across the world join in on the basic research to expand the knowledge of graphene properties. The potential uses of graphene in various forms as well as in combinations with other material. In addition to developing methods of making quality graphene in quantity at its lowest cost, Everyone was on a rampage to control their discoveries by applying for patents. As shown in the pie chart for 2014, over here, predominant activities for graphene throughout well, that whole decade from 2004 on was in research, right and rightly so. And for a very good reason, and I'll be able to talk about that very shortly, and by 20 26, so just a few more days, uh, producing things will, will dominate graphene's activities that I'll also talk about shortly. And you can see here I'm going to talk about composites, energy storage mechanisms, inks and coatings, and you notice just a little bit more research is going on. The research being com combining graphene with other 2D materials. 
In 2008, four years after the discovery of graphene, the costs to produce by the exfoliation method, that's the Scotch tape method basically, $645 million per square inch. So you saw that uh, picture where the woman was pulling a uh, Scotch tape, well, that was magnified thousands of times. Itty bitty little pieces that they got out at that time. In just a year, in 2009, the cost dramatically dropped a million times. It was running about $645. When the chemical vapor deposition process using a thin nickel layer was developed, in the following years, the nickel was replaced with copper, then replaced with copper foil, and a continuous 30-inch rolling method was developed to yield even cheaper large quantities of graphene that now would cost about $115 per square inch, and that's on a piece of copper foil. And the projected cost, as I'll talk about, will be pennies per square inch. Now, as I mentioned, graphene comes in many different forms, not just the sheets, but in uh, nano powders and so forth. This illustrates five basic techniques of making graphene, and these are mechanically reducing it with either chemicals, this is scotch tape, either by using chemicals or you're oxidizing it and then you're reducing it here. And then you have this particular one, which is breakthrough in cost, but it runs at very high temperatures and you get essentially the uh, graphene and then you can deposit graphene on a piece of carbon. There are other methods that some people have talked about. There's a guy in Russia that has a secret chemical and he pours it on graphite and all of a sudden it, ex it explodes making graphene all over the place. Okay, so here's the cost factors. And as you can see, if you take these numbers and multiply it by seven, you get the uh, US dollars in square inches versus euros. And you can see around this time frame over here, uh, we're in about $70 or so here, $100. And then we expect a large drop and it's going to be cheaper than carbon. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then, well, let's say, and then continue down into the pennies, pennies areas per uh, square inch. Then you have the patents. As I mentioned, they went wild on patenting everything they could possibly patent. And you can see the rates here, and in two trial, you were talking about, about 4,000 patents here. And this is showing the accumulative uh, numbers. And the number of patents are dropping off. However, that's not a good sign. And uh, I mean, it's not a good curve because they are still uh, issuing patents all over the place. And I'll talk about a couple of new ones just recently. OK, so re uh, graphene research is spread amongst all these various things. Here's the batteries, if you will, and lubrication I'll talk about. And I'll talk about all of the various subjects. Now, let's uh, look at some of this stuff. Some researchers and manufacturers have already developed graphene material that are improving the capabilities of lithium ion batteries. You're probably familiar hearing about that in electric cars and most of the power driven tools, electric cars and things of this sort. We have the lithium ion batteries. Well, graphene is also already being used for these batteries in the anodes and cathodes, showing significant improvement in their performance, greater capacity, faster charging, and discharging. And those faster charging and discharging are very important. How many times did you charge up your phone and you're waiting and you're waiting and it's not seconds? Furthermore, graphene is now being used for the active material itself in what is called a supercapacitor, a hybrid between a battery and a capacitor. A supercapacitor can hold an enormous amount of power, basically equal to uh, the, uh, the lithium ion battery, and can go from fully discharged to fully charged many orders of magnitude faster than comparable 
on the batteries and current. Now, graphene supercapacitors can be so flexible and light that they can be stitched into clothing. And you can see how flexible this could be. And they could put this kind of device in for power for uh, in the body and you can expect things to flex. And this shows a disc where there are micro supercapacitors. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit and show you a video. Just think in terms of the military personnel, uh, some of them can carry up to 16 pounds presently. This will have a huge impact. And then I'll like to show you this video, and this is where you can make your own battery. Hi, I'm Rick Keener, Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Materials Science and Engineering at UCLA. And I'm here today to tell you about our work on all carbon-based serum capacitors. We start with an ordinary compact disc, we put a sheet of plastic on it, we coat it with graphite oxide, an inexpensive precursor to carbon-based materials. We can then, on a computer, draw designs. We can put it in a disc drive, and using a laser scribe device, we hit it with an inexpensive infrared laser, and we can make a pattern. And you so have a light scribe, uh, light scribe, or DVD. That's all you open up the disc drive. We'll see our ordinary compact disc. We'll see our plastic coating and the pattern that we've designed. We'll simply peel off the plastic, and you can see here the nice golden brown material is the graphite oxide, and where it's been hit with the laser, it's turned into graphene. And if I take this material, and I turn it around, and we compare it to the pattern here, you'll notice that we've reproduced the pattern quite precisely. We can do this with thin materials, or we can do it with thicker materials. And so, for example, here's a thicker coating of our graphite oxide that's been laser scribed and turned into graphene. We can take this then and just cut it with the scissors and we can make different devices. And one of the devices that we've made is a supercapacitor. It's a flexible, all plastic based supercapacitor. It's just two pieces put together with a little electrolyte. You can see it's completely flexible. What's nice about this material, unlike conventional supercapacitors, which can be charged and discharged quickly but don't store much energy, this stores as much energy as a conventional battery. And it can be discharged or charged 100 to 1,000 times faster than an ordinary battery. So for example, charging this up for two seconds, we can run a light emitting diode for five minutes or so. Thank you. That's just a great to illustrate the fact that it does work. So you can go home now and uh, turn on your computer and make some gra graphene and take a pencil, shave it off, you have some graphite there and oxidize it a little bit and then you can make a supercapacitor. That's bringing down from $645 million down to a couple pennies, correct? Okay. Elon Musk says 500 mile Tesla electric car are just 10 years away. I believe that goal will be met sooner than later and graphene will play a major role helping him achieve his goal. This is what one of his batteries looks like in the present car. Tesla, as well as all of the other electric car manufacturers, are using graphene in some manner in their lithium ion battery system and will embrace the graphene supercapacitor system when available. They all have an incentive to use a plentiful raw material and have a safer, lighter, faster charging and discharging energy system that can incorporate a more efficient braking energy recovery system. What that means is that if you have an electric car and you put your foot on the brake, you're supposed to recharge the battery. Well, if you have a battery that takes 20 hours to recharge, you're not going to get much energy. But if you have a supercapacitor, it will charge just about all the energy you can uh, from the braking system. All these features will lead to a vehicle that would have great mileage at a lower cost to buy and operate. And at the same time, any and all technologies may gain 
the batteries are also super capacitors for cars, of them and any other of the technologies that you read about, would be applicable for the storage of wind, solar, ocean tides, wave motion, or any of those sorts uh, that you generate and put into an electric grid. Now, Tesla is selling their batteries for home use. If you have a solar system or a windmill, or if you want just a backup battery, you can charge it and you have it for home usage. At, the same, at this time, graphene has no safety issues such as reported for the lithium-ion batteries. I think you're all familiar, you probably heard about this just the other day, the hoverboards exploding. Uh, you might have heard about this woman being burned by a knee cigarette, or the iPod, or laptop, or even the Boeing 787 that was in Boston and they had a major fire. Basically, they all had fires that uh, were caused by contaminants in the battery. So that's one of the big costs of having these uh, ion batteries, is having it super clean. Now this company, Zap and Go, is the first graphene supercapacitor-based charger for smartphones and computer tablets. So uh, it takes about five minutes to charge, and then you can charge your device at its regular normal speed. If it had a supercapacitor, it would be charged in a matter of uh, seconds. One of the simplest and most effective way of harnessing the potential of graphene is to combine it with existing material called composite materials. The impact of graphene-based composites is said to be used throughout countless industries, enhancing performance and increasing application possibilities. And I imagine you could just think about that, the weight of some, here's, here's a bike and hardly weighs anything, or here's an automobile frame and hardly weighs anything, but yet it's as strong as the current ones are today. We can just go imagine that graphene-based composite, composite aircraft wings could drastically decrease its weight, increasing the aircraft's fuel efficiency and range. It would also reduce the detrimental effects of lightning strike uh, damage. Perhaps even using graphene-enhanced batteries in our supercapacitors could result in the lightest, strongest, safest, greenest planes. Now, researchers point out that three recent studies show why graphene is the material of choice for windmill turbine blades for their ultra-light, ultra-strong properties. Adding graphene to the epoxy composite at a ratio of one-tenth of a percent of the weight of the compound increased its strength by an order of magnitude. Just sprinkle a little stuff in there. Graphene members, membranes are being developed for water filtration, gas separation, and desalination projects. Researchers vision, vision clean drinking water for millions in developing countries and energy efficient produce drinking water anywhere along the shores of brackish or ocean bodies of water. Currently, there are some of these, what they call, uh, there are other names and other manufacturers. This happens to be uh, Life Straw. And what this is, is just built with some filtering material, but it's expendable. And so as used here, you can get all kinds of water and if they can upscale it to a larger one for the community. Well, the concept here that people are going to be working on is just using graphene, which is impermeable, and just except for the water, and there you go. You have a fairly good system, very inexpensive. Now, graphene membranes are being designed to be incorporated in the removal of carbon dioxide. We all know about that problem. And they're actually doing something about this in Europe. And they're putting in these, excuse me, they're putting They're putting in these filters over here to filter out the carbon dioxide. Rocky patented a new graphene filter that is 500 times thinner than those currently being used. Their filters is called perchlorine, I think that's what it's called, and requires about 100 times less energy to push seawater through their graphene filters. 100 times less, and here's the filter over here. Uh, 100 times less power, cheaper water. Okay. As I previously mentioned, graphene oxide membranes will only allow water, liquid, or vapor to pass through. 
This phenomenon had been used to further distill vodka, to further alcohol concentrations in a room temperature laboratory without the application of heat or vacuum as used in traditional distillation methods. They just had a bottle, opened it, put a filter on, and by gosh, vapor water came out, they had a strong ass party. Further develop, and by the way, that was at Manchester where they uh, developed the graphene. And that's only one of the zillion things they seem to be doing there. Further development and commercialization of such membranes could also revolutionize the economics of biofuel for, uh, production because uh, biofuel is water. And that's a big problem and uh, that would help there also. So as well as in the beverage industry. Apple has just filed a patent uh, for graphene, and it's a heat dissipator for mobile devices, your smartphones or whatever. They are, coated, uh, they are coating a polypropylene battery casing with graphene that occupied a fraction of the space of the graphite version for the same heat dissipation, allowing for bigger, longer-lasting battery to be installed. Saab has filed to patent graphene heating circuits for this de-icing aircraft, airplane uh, wing, wings. Here's another way out stuff. By combining graphite oxide with paint, a unique graphene coating is formed which can signal the end of the deterioration of iron used for ships, construction, and cars through rust. A ship's hull with a special paint, and it'll be illustrated in the little video, would also slip through the water with less drag. It's a win-win situation. So graphene paint is like any other paint that you're familiar with. The idea is that you have a coating on a material, and that coating protects and changes the property of the material. For example, we're looking at adding graphene to traditional paints, so ship hulls, where the graphene helps stop the salt, go from the seawater to the metal hull, and rust that hull. However, looking ahead beyond that, we're looking at exciting applications, just the idea of painting a solar cell onto a home using graphene and other 2D materials, and that then being able to power the home through a simple paint of the roof. That's far out thinking. Uh, here you can also do the same thing for bricks and stones. At MIT, researchers demonstrated that by coating electric power plant copper condensing tubes with highly durable graphene, their overall efficiency could improve 2 to 3 percent. This is an uncoated piece of copper, and you know it's just a little bit of droplet of water. And what you're trying to do is get the water out of this uh, area. And look at the difference when it's coated. That translates into a significant decrease in global carbon emission and millions of dollars savings per power plant per year. So that's not a trivial thing. Graphite, graphene could improve your tennis game. Anybody for tennis? Thanks to a special racket, and by the way, the professionals are using this right now. They took the weight from the shaft and put it where it's most useful, in the head and the grip. The problem is when they did this, the shaft was breaking. And uh, what they found was, well, let's put some graphene in there, and voila, they have a professional racket. Never need waxing skis without, ste uh, without steel edges are now available. They're one third the weight of any similar size ski on the current market. Cat Mike is a Spanish manufacturer of sport equipment is also using graphene. Their helmets, which the, uh, which the company claims are incredibly strong, lightweight, and more durable. And you're gonna hear this theme over and over again, strong, lightweight, and durable. And I'm hoping the uh, football people are watching this too, the NFL. They also provide graphene-enhanced cycling shoes with superior performance, again, being later and lighter and more durable. Currently, the majority of tablets, smartphones, and smartwatches have touch screens that are made using indium tin oxide, which is both expensive and inflexible. Replacing the indium tin oxide conductor on glass with the bendable, cheaper graphene bonded to plastic would mean super thin, unbreakable touch screens 
you would never have to worry about. Right, Joe? You remember that one? You remember? Oh, I'm sorry. You remember this? You dropped your phone. Okay. At the forefront of research, graphene's exceptional electrical, mechanical, and optical properties could make inexpensive printed, flexible, foldable electronic circuits a reality. And in fact, they actually have prototypes of this, this foldable and uh, actually visible. You can see right through the whole thing. And this shot over here just shows you what they're projecting for long term. And all this will become a matter of a few years or so. Samsung, one of the leaders, is all in on graphene, and it could mean real bendable devices. And it's real, they actually have something. It was discovered that graphene oxide can quickly bind to radioactive material in water and be condensed into solids. Obviously, this process would be useful in contaminated site cleanups, such as Fukushima and Chernobyl. But there's another problem graphene oxide is looking at, and that is where you're doing fracking. There are radioactive contaminants that they have. This is only one of many problems with fracking. It's, it's, it has a whole host of things that people just seem to be brushing aside in the fracking process. Biomedical applications is where uh, graphene is used in various forms, and they're using for MRIs and MRI CTs and photoacoustics and thermoacoustic thermography. You may have already had it. In addition, graphene is being used for drug delivery agents for cancer and other therapies, as I had discussed last month's, present, uh, last month's presentation on advances in nanotechnology. This is going to be interesting. In 2013, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation awarded grants for $100,000 to 11 condo uh, research groups, quote, offer the world a more desirable tool for reducing the prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases or for family planning reasons, end quote. Of course, the impermeability and strength features of the graphene composite are in play, since the University of Manchester, Manchester where Mr. G works, received one of those grants. In fact, they got some additional money uh, recently, so they must be making some headway. Graphene antennas capable of delivering better, cheaper, flexible, more powerful, and more sustainable and environmentally friendly RFIDs. Tags and wireless sensors have already been developed. They can be printed on paper or plastic with compressed graphene ink process and could be cheaply mass produced, paving the way for inventory control, wearable wireless devices, and sensors. So that eliminates the expensive base materials that they have been using. And they've demonstrated that actually they do work. This is very timely. The extreme sensitivity of graphene-based sensors that can identify and distinguish a large set of unique odors, irrespective of their chemical makeup, are being developed. Besides commercial applications, Sensors are being configured to detect chemical warfare agents and explosives. This will provide an early warning detection system for military personnel in the field and high value areas such as airports, major buildings, stadiums, and so forth. Researchers have found that graphene is twice as effective as, as an uh, absorbing impact as Kevlar the current material of choice for body armor for police and military personnel. In our government's infinite wisdom, they don't have the money to do the helmets for our guys. Yeah. While silicon has long been the standard for commercial solar cells, new research in Spain had shown that graphene could be far more efficient when it comes to transforming light into energy. Their theoretical study shows that graphene could offer 60% solar cell efficiency, double the widely regarded modern SQ maximum efficiency of silicon cells. It used to be 30%, the modern version is 33% now. 
They do, however, have experimental proof that not only can graphene work with every known wavelength, but that it also is substantially more efficient at converting light into energy than that of silicon, indium, tin oxide, or gallium arsenic. Being flexible and thin means that graphene-based solar cells could also be used on clothing. Think of the military. That would be a huge boom, the weight that they carry, recharge their supercapacitors. What a, what a boom that would be. Or you can retrofit the solar window, make solar windows, screens, curtains, and, and the roofs or other surfaces to help power a building. The major players for research and development using graphene for electronics are guiding their progress very closely, simply because billions of dollars are being spent for the many, many billions of dollars at stake. They are all dealing with a whole new technology with many of their technical challenges to make the use of graphene practical for their applications. However, if the number of patents awarded is any guide, China was leading the pack a few years ago, but had lost their lead to Korea, and in particular, Samsung. The United States, with IBM in a prominent position, is right in there. Probably the UK, and in particular the University of Manchester, where graphene was discovered, has very few patents, but has a strong list of sponsors and partners to develop a wide range of products. This illustrates some of the patent award, and you can see where Samsung is way out there. As I mentioned, they're committed. And what this uh, means is that when they file a patent, they file in the United States, Japan, and Europe, and wherever they can do it. So that's what they refer to as a family of uh, patents here. And come down the line here, and you can see various things. Even Taiwan is doing some here. Samsung already developed the graphene barrister chip. I never heard of this before. But it's a transistor light gate that operates at 300 gigahertz. And for those who are not familiar with it, that's an awful lot of zeros in front of hertz, which is cycles per second. So that's a, a trade. IBM builds graphene chips that 10,000 times faster than their first graphene chip using standard CMOS processing that says that their first one they made was really slow. And what they did was they just changed their process of how they made it and instead of depositing a uh, capacitor or resistor or whatever the heck it might be in their process, they just reversed it and they improved it 10,000 times. Uh, they're also uh, working on processes whose circuitry also uses graphene as illustrated here. Intel talks about graphene transistors, but doesn't expect them before 2020. And here they're talking about combinations of graphene with other material, which I'll briefly talk about at the end. Researchers made an elementary XOR gate out of only three graphene field effects transistors compared to the eight or more required use in silicon. That translates into a significantly small area on a chip that would be required to do the same function. However, more importantly, the transistors operated at an amazing clock speed of 427 gigahertz. Now, these computers today, like this one here, is kind of fast. It's around two, two, three gigahertz. So you can just see how much of the improvement they will be. New graphene-based image sensors was invented that is a thousand times more sensitive to light than current imaging sensors found in today's cameras and uses 10 times less energy because it operates at lower voltages. That means it's suitable for use in all types of cameras, including consumer cameras, near or mid-infrared cameras, and oh boy, traffic speed cameras and then satellite imagery. They're starting to produce uh, prototypes now, and they expect the cost to be five times less with all that uh, capability, a thousand times more capability. 
This is interesting. Smart contact lenses are being developed by Google to monitor blood sugar. Over here. And this technology is being enhanced by researchers that are developing a super thin infrared light sensor that could be applied onto contact lenses or night vision glasses to improve their performance. Of course, graphene is being used with its unique ability to absorb infrared rays and transform them into electrical signals almost the same way that silicon chips in digital cameras use visible light. Today, military personnel have to wear the bulky devices here uh, to see in the dark. Their performance and efficiency or replacement can be improved with this technology with an optimal solution being special contact lenses. Wow. Researchers developed a cheap graphene hybrid that outperformed platinum as a fuel cell catalyst. This will dramatically decrease the cost of the cells and increase its durability. This may be the breakthrough the hydrogen economy technology needs to become a viable option to a hydrocarbon burning engine. Perhaps you remember I gave that uh, subject of the hydrogen economy some months ago, maybe a year ago or so. And we also have this other researchers finding that uh, they can exceed the Department of Energy's hydrogen storage goal for 2020. These are for the hydrogen cars or hydrogen economy. And they're using graphene. They increased the storage capability for hydrogen to 9.7% by weight, far exceeding the 2020 goal of 7.5% the government has set some time back. So they're way ahead of that. Maybe the hydrogen cars and the system will come into being. Now adding 6 tenths of a percent graphene to the base material of a thermoelectric increase its conversion of heat into electricity five times and it will also operate over a wider range of temperatures from 75 to 1380 degrees Fahrenheit in comparison to today 930 13, uh, to 1380. What this means is that uh, waste heat in a car can be harnessed with this thermoelectric and they can run your air conditioner or, or do things of this sort. And uh, yeah. a lot of the uh, auto companies are doing it now. They're being funded by NASA of all places. But NASA has uh, usage for these in space devices. The Mars rover, for example, uh, could use something like that and be more efficient. Okay, let's go to lubricants. Scientists discovered using oil with graphene as a lubricant works better than oil with graphite that work better with their traditional pure oil, a base oil. The durability of oil graphene was six and a half times better than oil graphene. If you look at the charts, you can just see, oh, it's superior in every sense of the way, for wear, friction, things of this sort. So your, uh, your car would be more efficient, last longer. Researchers demonstrated that by adding 5% by volume graphene to coolants, the thermal conductivity of a base fluid increased 86%. Well, your radius could be small, do the same job, less weight. Uh, researchers demonstrated that with graphene, ultrasonic microphones and speakers could operate at frequencies from 20 hertz to 500,000 hertz, that's kilohertz. The speaker operated at a reported 99% efficiency with a flat frequency response across the audio range. What's this mean? One application is a radio replacement for long distance communications, giving sound's ability to penetrate ceiling water, unlike radio waves. There's more to come. Research has demonstrated incredibly fast optical response rates using graphene. They could pave the way for a revolution in telecommunications. Our present day communication optical switches respond at a rate of a few picoseconds. That's about a trillionth of a second. 
With a few layers of graphene, the rate was observed to be a hundred times quicker. Blue, uh, blood glucose testing, they're going to use graphene also. They're going to use graphene in bicycle tires. They're using it right now. Their tires uh, have better heat dissipation. They're lowering the temperatures by 60 to 90 degrees. And this is this is very crucial for the professionals that are running around Europe there, especially when they're going up and down the hills. They increase the lateral stiffness by more than 50 percent and reduce punctures, especially around the valve area. In India, they're making some tires. Same thing, 20 percent improvement with heat dissipation, mechanical uh, strength, abrasion, and so forth. Scientists have recently developed a magnetic sensor made with graphene, which they claim to be approximately 200 times more sensitive and current commercially available silicon sensors used in most home-based appliances such as washing machines and refrigerators. Better, cheaper. The discoverers of graphene now have another distinction to their credit. They are a part of the first mass market of commercially viable consumer product based on graphene. A new light bulb. That's what we need. This is their light bulb. There's some of the graphene on the uh, LED material, light emitting diodes, and this is showing the brightness of it. And it's going to be on the market very shortly. There's a company in Canada that's uh, assigned to be the marketing company. Scientists reported that they have demonstrated for the first time an on-chip visible light source using graphene on a silicon chip. That is the thinnest light source you could have, which is one atom thick. And this is one of the first steps to help make super fast computers, most likely you know, when the quantum computers are really developed, they have some kicking around now that will process light fast rather than electricity. Just imagine how fast these computers are going to be with graphene. Now, hot off the press, well, a few days ago. Researchers combined boron nitride with graphene. They dubbed it white graphene. Using this material as a substrate, material for graphene. So they put a layer of graphene on this other material. It will, with the combined effect, will be a thousand times faster than that of the graphene on other substrate material that already has been tested to be quite fast, 400. So you're talking about lightning speed, everything. Well, I have a question. Could this be a game changer square for electronic application, as Mr. G previously pointed out? Okay, thank you all. We agree that graphene could be the next material age, if you will, like the iron, the stone age, the iron age, bronze age, iron age, plastic, silicon, and now graphene. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Art, for a fascinating presentation. Approximately, uh, oh, I think 1955 or so, a long time ago, I was looking as an art teacher and a sculptor for a material that will produce an interesting patina on materials. I got some powdered graphite and used it on top. I, I experimented with various uh, surfaces. The best surface I found was a, a plaster of Paris that had been coated with a, a good quality paint. And when that solidified, I applied the graphite powder and got a most interesting patina. I use it with my students and uh, on their various sculptural uh, projects. It was uh, very fascinating. And I know the graphite, of course, is not graphene, but it's sort of the mother of it, right? 
And uh, well, uh, it, it's coal, gra graphite, graphene. Mm -hmm. It's all carbon. Well, this, this surface was beautiful. It has some. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so it's all carbon. Yeah. It, it had translucence to it. Yeah. That was unlike anything I've ever tried before. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, thank you for the animation. Same problem. If you if you have a gust of wind, a swirly thing like a tornado or a hurricane or something like that, it's going to toss one around whether it weighs a couple hundred thousand tons or whether it weighs a thousand tons. It's still going to move it around. Uh, the only thing that you could say is that if it's anchored well, it won't snap the wings off. It'll be much stronger. Yes. It appears, if I understood it right, that there are two elements involved in the presentation. One is the use of the carbon atom, and the other is that it's, it, you took a three-dimensional item and made it into a two-dimensional item. Is that the basic effect? Why carbon keyed in on, and what's the benefit of the two-dimensional thing versus, you know, three that we have? Okay. Two-dimensional means basically you can't get anything smaller. It's one out of thick. So yes, there is a thickness. So it's really three-dimensional, but you can't get any lower than that. They're all carbon. Why? It's just way. Uh, why? Yeah. Why not any other atom? Or, or is the potential for taking other atoms and bringing it down to a two-dimensional? Yes. Yes, as Mr. G pointed out, and I pointed out in my next to last slide, that they're combining some other two-dimensional materials together, and they're actually looking at it to be even stronger than graphene itself. They, uh, one of the materials will act as a partial insulator, and so when you combine it with a, a one that is not an insulator and an insulator, you work better with it. It works better as an electronic switch off on and so forth. So as Mr. G said, that there are multiple brothers and sisters now of graphene. Once, once the floodgate was open and they said, hey, we can do something, then they have this. And now they're looking at the combinations of various things to do even more uh, with it. But it's all basic. I mean, when I talk about graphene, it's carbon. If I talk about graphite, it's carbon. If I talk about coal, it's carbon. So what does the carbon atom have that seems to be key? It's the strength of the, the atoms keeping together. They're very strong. And you can it, it's extremely hard to break. And that's it, the bonding of all the stuff. Nanotechnology. Nanotechnology, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, he, he talked about the Yes. <laughs> it still has weight. And what you do is, uh, you know, aerodynamics, what makes a plane fly. Well, you have some, essentially the same thing with an automobile. You do have some lift. And if you recall seeing some of those cars, they used to have a little fin in the back to keep, keep the weight on the rear tires for the rear drive and so forth. It's, so it's a the car, the car is going to get a new shape. Yes. It will always, always, they're going to always be shaping the vehicles so that they're less resistant to air, therefore the cars are more efficient. The electrical, gas, or whatever it might be, it's the same concept. And yes, uh, as I said, I like a heavy car because it keeps me on, on, on the road. Tell me the smart material. Yeah, well, you'll be protected better. So you'll get the crash, which will get her. Yeah, you'll have all... <laughs>
you have a very strong uh, frame, much, much stronger. And when it's windy, you go 60 instead of 80. Yes, uh, now this material reminds me of salt we used to know. It accentuates the positive and eliminates the negative. Yeah. What is the question? I noticed that picture up there. I don't think that's a pattern in person. Because you're our Professor G. <laughs> that's Mr. Graphite. Uh, actually, that uh, video came from Manchester, University of Manchester, where, uh, as they mentioned, that's where they discovered, I guess we discovered the graphene. They have a new building that uh, uh, the government gave them some two, four hundred million dollars to build. They have today somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 500 scientists working on graphene. Europe, the Europeans combined together and they put together uh, some billions of dollars, I'm not too sure whether it's one or five, but some number like that of a joint effort throughout Europe working on graphene. You don't see too many reports, there's a few of them, if you watch TED, uh, Technical ed Education and so forth, uh, on the YouTube, you will hear a lot of the uh, fellows from Europe and gals uh, talking about what they're doing with graphene. And it's quite fascinating. Usually this uh, talk is some number of hours. So if you're interested, go to you, uh, YouTube, uh, put in the title Graphene, and you'll see hundreds and hundreds of uh, videos. You'll even see videos of where uh, individuals at home are making graphene. And it's showing, oh, I can make it bigger, better, and it only takes a half hour or an hour or something of this sort. There's a whole ton of different, uh, different ways of doing it that they are doing people in their garage, if you will. Yes. Sure. Uh, when you take an oil change, if you get an oil change in your car and you offer you synthetic blend oil, does that have any of this graphene? No. The blend oil is all synthetic material, it's not uh, common. But excuse me, the question was, uh, when you change your oil, you, uh, you have synthetic oil, is there any graphene in it? This is, if you notice, these are all in universities. All this work is going on in universities across the world. No matter where you go, uh, I try to put some of their logos on there so you get a little feeling uh, where people are doing things. Well, I'm hoping that uh, we go to zero. Just think in terms of oil. Uh, fracking, as I mentioned, is not a panacea there. This is real bad stuff, and uh, there's real worries about uh, it getting into the aquifer, and that is serious trouble. They're known that you know, where they're doing fracking, they even have earthquakes, let alone radioactive problems, uh, material, and so forth. So, yes, I, that's fine. Now the question is, how are you going to charge the battery? What's the source of, from the grid? Well, if you go into better solar, you go into uh, tides, uh, effects, there's some place off of Scotland, England, Ireland, that they have some, uh, that they're really going to go on and putting up some systems there. Uh, those are necessary, they're better, and obviously the environment will be happy. Yes. Uh, the other day I read an article that Boeing is creating a new product. Most likely. I'm not familiar specifically, but most likely, yes. Where they said they'll be able to uh, use it for uh, uh, planes and uh, uh, space exploration. China just finally opened up two weeks ago. You've seen that. 
No, not, not that specific one. Yeah. Can you repeat what she said? Excuse me. Oh, somebody had uh, somebody asked a question about connection between graphene and 3D printing. My one of my other favorite subjects. Absolutely yes, because they have. Uh, I mentioned it. They they have graphene ink, and that is perfect for printing. And so they are printing circuits right now with graphene on a 3D device. So yes. They are doing it. Okay, I think we, we probably should go. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we call it, we call it this is a in graphene. Very much. My glasses have graphene.